When it comes to the issue of abortion, it has become uh, America's holocaust. Since the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973, at least one million unborn children every year have lost their lives to abortion. And countless women and men have had to suffer from the negative consequences of abortion. Abortion provides temporary relief, but afterwards comes the bigger package of depression and guilt and shame and sorrow and regret that you live with for many, many years. I come from a generation where at least a third of my generation isn't here because of abortion. And for me, that's just unconscionable. And I can't live in a society where millions upon millions of my fellow American citizens are not here. We did a lot of research. And you know, one of the things that we discovered is that there are women in the church having abortions. Our research found that four out of every 10 women who has had an abortion was actively going to church at the time of her abortion. And the reality is that when it comes to the abortion issue and the life issue, the church has not really been using that transformative power that it has around this issue. It's been an issue that's been outside of the church when the problem is inside the church and the church has a call to the broader culture. So we're inspired around this project specifically to do that. This is a tool that will help mobilize the church. Most pastors I know are concerned about the well-being of people in their church as well as outside of their church. Well, we need to be as equally concerned about the, the life in the womb. And so uh, because it's an issue of life and God is the author of life, that we must be in life-related issues. For us, it's a priority, and I think it should be a priority for any pastor who's concerned about comprehensive ministry. As a Christian, our hope should be Christ's hope. And the last thing that he said was what? Go and make disciples of all nations. And certainly God has really given us an opportunity, a unique opportunity uh, in this day and age in our culture for this life issue to be an amazing vehicle to help make disciples for Jesus Christ. A life disciple is someone who is willing to work with women and men as they are facing a pregnancy decision. As a life disciple, we have the honor and the privilege and the blessing of walking with people in the middle of their crisis. When I was pregnant at 17, I went to our local OBGYN and he asked me, is this good news or is this bad news? And I said, this is not good news. And he said, well, here's the number for an abortion clinic in New York City. And that was really the extent of the counseling that I had or the care. You know, it was like, if this is an unplanned pregnancy, abortion is a solution. And if I had a life disciple at 17, I would have chosen life instead of abortion. What conquers fear is love. And when you envelop this lady with love and encouragement and compassion, that I want to cry with you, I want to laugh with you, I want to embrace you, I want to love you, you've opened up the door to share the gospel. So the Bible is clear that God has authored life, He sustains life, and his goal is that we might have abundant life that Jesus Christ offers. And of course, the church is the best place to offer all of it. I firmly believe the more educated people are about the abortion issue, the more and more people become pro-life and want to protect unborn children and women and men from the destruction of abortion. Because that's really to the core of how we solve the abortion issue in our country, is to reach the people that it's impacting the most. Our goal with this curriculum is for people who will be trained as life disciples and who have an opportunity to meet with people who are facing a pregnancy decision. I mean, people who have before them life or death. 
Our hope and our prayer is that you will help them choose life. Good morning. My name is Christine, and I'm with Sandpoint Life Choices Pregnancy Center, and I am honored to be here with you today to share some information about the abortion issue in our culture. I'm guessing that some of you found it shocking, that statistic that four in 10 women who are choosing abortion are actively attending church at the time. You see, abortion is a complicated issue. Many are tempted to think that it's mostly young teenagers who are perhaps from broken homes and experimenting with alcohol, drugs, and sex who face this decision. That's just simply not the case. Only 23% of the clients at Life Choices Pregnancy Center are teens. In fact, over 60% of our clients are between the ages of 20 and 27 years old. We even have clients in their 40s who are facing this decision. Over 50% of the women we see were using contraception that failed. And so especially for these women, it is very surprising that they became pregnant. The majority of the women are single, but we have 24% of our clients who are married. We've served women who are far from God, but as we just learned, we also serve women who are seeking a relationship with God. In fact, 70% of women who choose abortion identify as Christian. You might be surprised to know that the reason women choose abortion is varied as well as interrelated. There's usually more than one reason a woman is considering abortion. Over 70% feel unable to financially provide for the child. And this is the case whether they're married or single. 48% cited relationship problems with the father of the baby as one of the reasons, while 42% indicate that having a baby would interfere with their education or their career. Some women feel ill-equipped to mother a child. And then there are those who are told by the doctor that their baby has an abnormality of some kind and should be aborted. Some are from strong Christian homes and they simply cannot bring themselves to the idea of putting their families through the difficulty of having a daughter who got pregnant outside of marriage. Yes, there are many differences among the women, but one thing they all have in common is incredible fear and the feeling of being alone. They just want their situation to disappear. And they believe the lie that once the abortion is done, they can go back to their life as if nothing ever happened. That's just simply not true. Our society is selling a huge lie to these men and women, and they're buying it lock, stock, and barrel. Since abortion became legal in the United States, there have been over 60 million abortions. That's 19% of our country. Planned Parenthood is responsible for over 7.9 million of them. And this year alone, yes, in the last 14 days, there have been 31,824 abortions. And although many believe 
that abortion should be legal in instances of rape and incest, only 308 abortions have been because of those tragic circumstances. Worldwide, there have been over 1.4 billion abortions. Let's put that into perspective. That would wipe out the entire country of China. Friends, our culture is pressuring men and women into a decision and then leaving them alone in the dark to suffer the consequences. A study published by the British Journal of Psychiatry states that women who had an abortion experience an 81% increased risk for mental problems such as anxiety disorder, depression, and even suicidal tendencies. Why are these things not being reported in the media? Why are we not telling these women and men that abortion will not only take the life of their child, but of theirs as they know it as well? Instead, abortion is touted as a women's right. A women's right. <laughs> if we really loved these women, we would tell them the truth. We would tell them that abortion is an absolute tragedy. Some refer to it as a holocaust. Mother Teresa, when asked about abortion, said this, it is a poverty that a baby must die so that you may do as you wish. Any country that allows abortion is not teaching its people to love but to use violence to get what they want. How can we tell a mother that she can kill her unborn child and then tell others that they can't kill one another? That's why the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion. Our society is teaching lies and immorality. We are a people who are hurting our culture is broken, and we desperately need a savior. Our society is sick, and the only people who have the cure is you, the church. You see, we know that what society needs is a relationship with Jesus Christ. We know that he is the answer. He can make it possible for us to change our thinking, our behaviors, and our desires to match his. He makes it possible for us to rise above our circumstances and live in peace, joy, and hope, no matter what our reality looks like. We, the church, know that Jesus makes all the difference. The local church has a purpose to evangelize or introduce people to the king, to worship or glorify the king, and to edify or build up the work of our king in his body, the church. I'm talking about discipleship. We have a voice and it needs to be heard. I pray that you will seize the day and engage with your neighbors in loving, caring ways that point them to Jesus. We need to start reaching out to our society. We need to create a culture of unconditional love in the church and in the surrounding community. We need to walk alongside these women and men who are facing unplanned pregnancy and help them to choose life. But we can't stop there. We need to help them with whatever they need to raise this child. 
babysit if needed, help them with their groceries, help them get their car fixed. We need to be the church as described in Acts 2, 44 through 47, that says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God blesses and builds his church. The video you saw is an introduction of the training that Life Choices Pregnancy Center offers called Making Life Disciples. This training will equip the church to engage in loving, caring conversations with those who are facing unplanned pregnancy and abortion decisions. This program runs for seven weeks and we'll be starting another one in a couple of months. This will equip the church to engage with their community and help them come to know the love, grace, and healing power of Jesus Christ. Now that is what our suffering world needs. So I invite you to consider signing up for this class so that you can learn to be the church that Jesus gave us. Thank you. Life is never scripted. It rarely unfolds the way we want. There is pain, loss of trust, Guilt and shame can be overwhelming. Life can sometimes leave us with unwanted circumstances and feeling utterly alone. No matter how tough life can be, you're not alone in this. We can help. At Open Arms, we hold your story completely confidential. We know that an unplanned pregnancy can create a lot of questions with no easy answers. That's why we believe everyone should have free access to truthful information and be informed about your choices. Regardless of your circumstances, we offer compassionate care to those facing an unplanned pregnancy, helping you plan the path most liberating for your future. You are not alone. I'm Janet, the Executive Director of Open Arms in Coeur d'Alene. Bob just whispered to me that first line, um, life is not scripted. Isn't that true? We get curveballs constantly. It's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you for inviting me, and also thank you that we are your mission of the week. That's pretty cool. Uh, Open Arms has been around for 16 years. We are starting our 17th year now. We are a nonprofit, non-political, non-denominational organization committed to providing compassion, information, and support to anyone facing an unintended pregnancy. We do not offer or recommend or refer for abortions or abortifacients. We are committed, however, to offering accurate information about abortion, uh, the procedures, and, and the risk involved. We believe that everyone has a right to truthful and accurate information. Therefore, all of our services are free of charge, even the ultrasounds, and everything that happens there is kept confidential. One thing I thought was really interesting is that uh, the US, in the US, the abortion rate, we have one of the highest of the developed countries. 50% of women seeking abortion have already had at least one abortion. 
51% of abortions are performed on women on less than 25 years of age. There are lots of statistics, and Christine shared with us quite a few of those, and they're painful. But it's still a clear indication that we have a lot of work to do. And this vital ministry of open arms and the, the pregnancy care centers throughout our nation are really vital. It's easy for us to focus on the darkness, and we have gals who come in who are confused and afraid and worried and panicked, and they don't really know what to do. And we have wonderful, compassionate, and caring individuals who meet with them and talk with them and listen to them, no matter what their situation. We are open arms, and they are greeted with open arms and a non-condemnation. We are open, and we listen, and we care, and we are there for you. Actually, we have cards to say that. You are not alone. We are here for you, and we are. We also have um, male advocates. The guys have had kind of a, um, not really much of a voice over these decades, and that's unfortunate. And lots of times the guys come and they're sitting in the lobby and they're twiddling their thumbs. They don't know what's going on behind the doors there. But we have male advocates who are available and they go out and ask the guys, would you like to come back and talk? And oftentimes they do. And so they're, they are taken back and joined with their, um, their partner later. Um, I want you to know that we're making a difference. It was noted just a bit ago, but yes, pregnancy care centers are now outnumbering abortion clinics. About 2,500 uh, um, pregnancy care centers to 1,800 abortion clinics. We also have uh, trained registered nurses who do the medical part of our clinic. They perform lab quality pregnancy tests and limited obstetrical ultrasounds to confirm pregnancy, viability, and the age of the baby. Lots of times we get calls, I want to know how far along I am. Come on in. And we bring them in and we perform the free ultrasounds. We also have parenting classes that should the, the clients and patients decide they want to parent their child, we prepare them with video um, teachings and studies. They earn um, boutique bucks for doing this, and they're able to spend that money in our boutique that is stocked with free items donated by this wonderful and giving community. Clothes, diapers, shoes, blankets, equipment, it's just food, it just goes on and on. Uh, also, we uh, give referrals. We have so many available resources in this community, and we are able to send them to the different places that need, they need to go to receive the support. Um, like Christine was saying earlier, too, is that you know the churches are very important, and we would really, really love to lock arms with the churches in our community and work with you in this endeavor, and even have some churches willing to take um, patients and clients and disciple them. We also have um, post-abortive support and Bible studies. Lots of women for even some for decades who are still suffering. They haven't been able to share and to uh, get rid of that, that guilt or the anxiety or the pain. And so we have that available as well um, with very caring and committed Christian ladies. We also have a mobile clinic that we are able to use to get to those who can't get to us. We have a school outreach. We are able to go into the high schools and the middle schools, uh, same message, two different programs, uh, and minister to them uh, with a sexual risk avoidance um, it's curriculum. We are also available by phone 24-7. Uh, we answer the phone, of course, when we're in the office, and when we're not, if that number is dialed, there is a live person um, answering and able to talk with them, schedule appointments, whatever is needed at the time. Also, um, just, just to give you some idea of what we've done to serve our community this past year, we saw 643 people come through our doors. We performed 265 pregnancy tests and 144 ultrasounds. We had 154 at-risk clients this year. At-risk meaning they were vulnerable for abortion or maybe even abortion-minded when they came in. And out of that number, 119 chose life after support. Those are only the numbers that we are aware of. That doesn't mean that more 
didn't change their mind afterwards. The gospel was also presented 53 times. We can't do that if it's against their will or their wishes, but we offer. And when they accept, we certainly do, and we're excited to do that, and we hope that number grows. Uh, also, one last thing I'd like to, to bring up is that the abortion pill reversal. At our November fall event, we had Rebecca Buell come and speak with us. Uh, she had the abortion pill reversal procedure done, and she has quite a story. Uh, raised in a Christian home, she found herself as a college student um, pregnant and not married. And she was frightened, um, but she finally told her parents, and they were devastated, but they forgave her and embraced her, and she was living at home, going to college, raising her son. And then, uh, when she was 19 years old, she found herself pregnant again. And she thought, oh my gosh, there is no way I can go and tell my dad that I did this again. And so she panicked and called Planned Parenthood and went there and took the abortion pill. It's a chemical medical uh, abortion, and there's two pills are, are involved. The first one um, blocks progesterone, which is vital for the nurturing and life of the baby, and the second one causes contractions to expel the baby. Well, she took the first pill, went out to her car, and thought, Oh my gosh, what have I done? I can't do this. And she panicked and she ran back in and she said, I've changed my mind, I can't do this. And she was told by Planned Parenthood, it's too late, there's nothing that can be done. And she's like, what? You know, so she went back to her car, she got her phone and she starts, you know, like I think we do, trying to find out if there's something out there that, that, that I can do, is there's gotta be some kind of recourse. And she was able to find a doctor who's located in San Diego and she uh, lived in, in the Sacramento area, and that was pretty far apart. But he said, I have a brother who's a doctor who's like 20 minutes from you. I will call him. And she was able to go, and she um, went through the reversal and her, gave birth to her, um, her second little boy a few months after that. She brought him with her to our banquet. And uh, he's four years old now, and he is so cute. He even goes up on stage with her, and, and he uh, spoke to the audience himself. Precious little guy. We are hoping that we can find a local doctor here that we can refer to. Should we get one of those panicked calls? Oh my gosh, I've taken this pill. I don't want to, whoa, 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 you know, what do I do? We want to be able to say, don't, don't worry. We have a referral for you, and to be able to send them to that doctor. Um, as of yet, we don't have one locally, but we do have a doctor in Spokane who was willing to do this for us, and he said, uh, of course, you may refer to me. Lots of times, though, transportation is difficult um, for our patients, and so having someone locally would be really, really important. Uh, also, I want to challenge you. There are many ways that you can get involved and help us in this vital ministry. Uh, we will train you. There's no reason um, to panic or to worry or to think, can I do this? I can't do it. Yeah, you can do this, and we will help you. There are many different areas. You don't have to just be an advocate, uh, a women's advocate or a male advocate. We have lots of other areas that we need help in. Uh, for instance, clerical. Uh, we could use clerical help, fundraising, and being on our planning committees, and decorating our clinic. We had one church in town called and said, what can we do for you? And we said, well, we have a male mentoring program, and we really don't have a place you know, to take them back to. And they said, let us do that. So they came in, they painted, they bought furniture, they hung curtains. I mean, it's a man cave, and it's so cool. So, <laughs> so now the guys go out, and they have a place to take these, these young guys back and talk with them. Um, we also uh, need help in our boutique, our clothing boutique. And th that is all new clothing, but we do get um, very gently used baby clothing that there's one sweet lady who comes every Wednesday and she's constantly folding and sorting and putting out because we offer diapers and clothing to our community free of charge. Also, this one is major, we need prayer. Uh, this is warfare. We are on the front lines here. The enemy does not like what we're doing, and we battle in this spiritual warfare every single day. If any of you can pray, and if any of you are intercessors, please remember us. Also, too, like I said, we have a school program. We have a need for presenters. Again, you will be trained. It's, it's, uh, it's not that scary. 
So if that is something that you would like to do, please uh, come and see us about that. We'd love to have you. Um, also, our teaching program is called sexual, well, it's not called that. I, I have a, I'm a sexual risk avoidance specialist. Sounds really cool, huh? Anyway, we, we've been trained in sexual risk avoidance teaching, which is basically the opposite of what's been happening in our schools for decades with the comprehensive sex education. Their goal pretty much is kids are going to do it. This is going to happen. Let's just try to reduce the risk. Well. Uh, what does that say about our belief in our children? We believe our children can abstain. And so we teach them sexual risk avoidance. The only way not to get any of the risk from sexual behavior is to not engage in the activity. And so we give them the tools uh, to do that. Um, let's see. It's basically a holistic approach, the sexual risk avoidance. It's for the optimal health of the individual. And it's um, the typical healthcare model, which like, and I used the example of smoking earlier, it's like when someone is smoking, they say, you need to stop smoking. And if you don't smoke, don't start. And that's pretty much the same message that we give the children in this, uh, this arena. And, I also wanted to say that, you know, the, the sexual, um, the comprehensive sexual education really truly believes that kids are going to do this, but it's really not true. This message, the sexual risk avoidance message is resonating with our teens and more and more and more of them are deciding not to engage and we're thrilled about that. And this is the kind of education that parents want their children to have. We strongly promote waiting until marriage as the healthiest choice, both physically and emotionally. There's a lot of emotional damage that is done as well in that behavior. So there's many ways that you can help us uh, join the team. We love to bring hope and light and love into every situation, to every meeting that we have with those who come to us, and you can be a part of that. So thank you again for having me here this morning. It's been a privilege speaking with you. Uh, in the back, if you'd like to sign up, uh, even though I mentioned that all of our, our um, services that we provide are free of charge, they're not free to us. We have to pay for them. And if another thing that you can do, if, if you're able and would like to, is to become a monthly donor. Um, there's a sign-up list in the back on our table, and you can sign up to give uh, whatever amount um, you feel comfortable giving. And Please know that that money will be used to help women and men in need and hopefully save lots and lots of babies. So thank you very much. Uh, a lot of tears this morning, amen? Well, I will tell you that my job is to talk about adoption. And I want to tell you that I'm an expert in the field. And you may not think that I'm an expert. I may not look like an expert. But I want to tell you that um, in 1965, my 15-year-old mother got pregnant by a man that she barely knows. In fact, so much I have no idea what my biological father's last name is. My mother uh, put me up for adoption because her parents said that was the right thing to do. I met my mother in 2003, and last week I went to a pastor's conference on the Oregon coast, and I had dinner with my mother, and it was one of the most wonderful dinners I've had with her. Amen. Ronald Reagan said this, I see all of you here that are for abortion are already born. <laughs> I'm glad to be alive today. I'm glad to serve the Lord. So I'm an expert because I'm adopted. I'm also an expert because... My wife and I adopted. We have four children, three of them. My, my line used to be, do you know why I got three kids? Because I didn't want four. Do you know how to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> I have four children because that's what the Lord would have me have. And so today we're going to talk about adoption. And if we're going to ask people to not abort their children, church, if we're going to ask people to keep their kids, then we got some work to do. We've seen this verse up on the screen lots today because I believe that it's not that we all stole everybody's verse. I believe the Holy Spirit is doing something. 
I believe the Holy Spirit is putting in our hearts. And I will tell you, two years before I adopted my child, I knew that God was going to have us adopt. There was a uh, symposium at your church, Pastor Tim, and um, it was about adopting. And I told my wife, we should go to that. And we both agreed that we should adopt. And that would be something the Lord was telling us. And then two years later, when there was an opportunity to adopt a little girl, we both knew this is what God was telling us to do. I don't think everybody should adopt, but I think that the Holy Spirit is working on some of you. And I believe the Holy Spirit is going to put in your heart. And so as we go today and you take notes, if it, if it don't stop, then start praying. And it may take two years or three years or whatever it is, but... Um, James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. So all you got to do is go visit them. I mean, hey, just show up and go, hey, I'm Mike. I'm here to visit. <laughs> but that word means this, to take care of or look after with the implication of continuous responsibility. To look after, to take care of, to see it to it that no one lacks the benefits of God's kindness. I've cried a lot this morning. My mother who adopted me had three uh, tubular pregnancies. And uh, the only thing that she could do was adopt. And so they adopted my brother. They thought to themselves, we can do better. And we adopted me after that. And I'd like to think that that's why they stopped. But the truth of the matter is the adoption agency said, here, we have a child for you. We as Christians have a history of taking care of babies. We as Christians have a history of adopting children and taking, because we know what it's like to be adopted. Because the Bible says that we were adopted by Christ. During the time of the Romans, the Romans had no value to their children. They would take their born children, take them to the edge of the city and leave them. And we as Christians would go get the babies and raise them as our own. I'm going to reference a book pretty soon. And as I reference that book, one of the things that just broke my heart was that it said that people who are pro-abortion don't believe that we should adopt. They don't believe we should adopt because they believe that genetics is important. And, and I got to tell you today, is it genetics more important or being a mommy and a daddy more important? Is it more important to have a baby that's just like you or is it more important to, have, to be a mommy and a daddy? Being adopted it has been fun for me to watch my biological family and realize, boy, those people are crazy. <laughs> when I met my biological mother, the first thing I told her is, uh, thank you for not choosing abortion. I knew that's what I would tell her. I knew from the time I was this tall, as soon as I understood and comprehended abortion, that this was what I would tell her. Thank you for not choosing abortion. My little girl that we adopted is now seven years old and has been listening to this controversy and wanted to know what abortion was about. I'm so thankful that her mother didn't choose abortion. I told my mother who adopted me, thank you for giving me a better life. And she did. I told that story on the radio station one morning and a caller called in in tears. Is that really true? Yeah. And she said to me that when her biological son found her, this is the exact words that he told her. Thank you for not choosing abortion. Now, my mother said, I never thought of that. But I'm thankful that she didn't. Aren't you? I'm watching. I'm watching. <sighs> Children waiting to be adopted in the United States. I was concerned about adopting a child. I was 43 years old. My father was 42 years old when he adopted me. And uh, I, was, I didn't want to be old when I had kids. And uh, I, I, my dad didn't do a lot. He was a World War II veteran. He had been shot in Okinawa. He was part of the first uh, group of soldiers to go in Okinawa. And he had shrapnel in him. Could you imagine having shrapnel in you? And uh, I guess I should look over there. And, and so... My father didn't do a lot of things with me, and I thought, well, I'm going to have all my kids young. And, and so then when uh, this little girl was uh, put in our life, we knew we had to adopt. And one of the things I was worried about was, uh, is, is maybe I'm taking a child away from somebody else. Maybe, maybe there's somebody else. i got three kids already, and, and maybe, maybe somebody else who needs a little baby, and I'm going to take that opportunity away from them. And then when I saw this statistic, I realized there's plenty of babies for all of us. 
Children waiting to get adopted in the United States. If you look in the state of Idaho, there's 330-some children waiting to be adopted in our state. That means they have no holds. That means their parents have given up their rights or their rights have been taken away. And there is no reason under the sun these kids can't have a home except for we're not giving it to them. In Washington State, there's over 10,000 children in foster care. But did you know that in Washington State, there are 5,000 Christian churches? If each church would just take two kids, there would be no kids in foster care. Do you see what I'm saying? There are currently 1,818 children in foster care in Idaho. 373 of these children are waiting for adoptive families. Is God calling you to do that? Is there an empty room in your house? There's plenty of room in your heart, I suppose. Now, I don't agree with the the positions of all these people, all right? Don't don't bombard me and go, I don't like that guy. But let me just tell you this. Many moms have taken loving care of their babies and young children and then gifted them to another family to love and raise. These women blessed the world with Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, Maya Angelou, Moses. you got to say it like this, so Moses. Augustus Caesar, Helen Keller, Florence Nightingale, President Gerald Ford, Newt Gingrich, Scott Hamilton, John Hancock, Art Linkletter, Nelson Mandetta, Michael Orr, First Lady Nancy Reagan, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Babe Ruth, Dave Thomas, founder of Wendy's, Faith Hill, Melissa Gilbert, Dan O'Brien, and countless others. And as an adopted child, I used to remember that they would talk about that on television. And, and I think how wonderful it was that I wasn't the only one who was adopted. I still like eating at Wendy's just for that. Do you know that he does have a, a uh, foundation, even though that he's dead, to help adopt kids? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Also, I want to tell you that Kevin Max of DC Talk is adopted. Todd Agnew is adopted. But I want to talk about something that we talked about earlier, but we don't talk about one of the players in the manger scene as much as uh, the rest of them. We talk about Mary and Elizabeth and the shepherds, but we don't talk about Joseph very much. Do you know that Joseph was an adopted father, adoptee father? That he adopted a child named Jesus. And it's a different story than the other adoption stories. And, and it was probably a lot easier in his household than it was for my mom raising me. But do you realize that Joseph loved Jesus? That he taught Jesus Torah? That he walked with Jesus? He protected Jesus as he went to Egypt as his own child, knowing full well. And so today, I hope the Holy Spirit's working on your heart. Pretty amazing stuff we've heard today. The whole gamut. I, as I was thinking about this service and what it is that we want to try to get across, I really want to make sure that everybody knows that the church is actively involved in its role as the church in a very horrible situation in our country. The fact that just the pregnancy care centers have begun to outnumber the abortion clinics, that was something that you brought earlier. That's, I love that. Um, we're making a difference. And it's not the stuff that's out there in the newspapers and they don't put it on uh, the radio stations and everything. I, but I want you to know Jesus Christ cares and is involved and is moving in this country in regards to abortion. And he uses us. That's where we come in. If the statistics are correct, and they are, that means that you know somebody that's had an abortion. Somebody maybe in your family, somebody in your circle of friends, somebody you know at work, somebody that you know is hurting Not to mention all the young guys and gals, particularly the gals that are contemplating it right now, wondering what to do. You know, as Christians, we need to be involved in people's lives close enough that we would know those things and that we could be there with them and for them. And we could tell them that this God that made you and made that little one loves you, wants to get to know you, 
wants to be involved in your life. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 1, I just want to read a couple of passages out of Ephesians chapter 1 and out of chapter 3. The point is, is most of the time when I'm in trouble or not doing what I should be doing or however that works, I used to always think that God was mad at me, upset at me, wanting to throttle me because I'd stepped out of line when I found out over the years what he's doing is he's standing there, he's standing there, sitting there, I don't know what he's doing. He's there saying, Bub, just turn to me. Just move this direction because I'm there. And I want you to know that I love you and that I care about you and I want to be in your life. And we can fix whatever's gone wrong. But I'm there for you. That's something that we need to pay attention to in other people's lives and introduce them either for the first time to the God that loves them or talk to him again about the God that's always cared about him and wants to be there. This is a prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. First service, I, may, I want to make it clear. I, I don't know if I made it clear the first service. I want to make it clear that this is God's words to you. If the word of God is what he spoke and he used the Apostle Paul in this case to write it down... It's something that he wanted each one of us to hear today. This is his heart towards you. If you're doing good, if you're not doing good. Chapter 1, verse 15 says, Therefore I also, after I had heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in, knowledge of, in the knowledge of him. That's what he wants you to know. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants you to know him better. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards the, us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? That's what God wants you to know about him. Verse 18, it says that he wants us to know what is the hope of his calling and the riches of his of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Brothers and sisters, that's our message. <laughs> we have to be able to be the ones that are giving that message out. You know, Christina and Jana both mentioned opportunities to minister in these clinics. You would have plenty of people to talk to. If God's tugging on your heart, I, I would really ask you to answer that call. It's important that we're out there. And here's just two of probably the many things that we can do to give people hope. You see, our hope is designed by God to get us to, to believe that the future is bright because Jesus Christ is in, on, in the future. He's in our future. He has our future squared away. And when I hear somebody that they've lost hope, my heart breaks. Because tomorrow's got to be bright. Tomorrow has got, you got to see the sun come up tomorrow, right? Our hope is the one thing that gets us from today to tomorrow to the next day to the next day. And when you've lost hope, you guys, as Christians, we have the answer to that problem. We have Jesus Christ living not only in us, he's in our minds, he's on our lips. We need to be the ones that take hope to a hurting world. These folks are hurting, and they're all around us. 
Seek them out. Find out who they are. Ask God to bring them to you, and I believe that he will. <laughs> but let's be on the, the lookout. Let's be looking for these people that are hurting in this particular way and tell them that God loves them so very much.